So I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this workshop. I'm going to talk today um, about diffusion-based metrics of perfect for biological uh, network analysis. And in this workshop, of course, we're going to be seeing a lot of pictures like this. Um, and the problem that I want to talk about attacking today is the issue that comes from the fact that many of these uh, networks are so-called small world networks. Uh, probably a lot of the people in this audience would like to um, quibble with me about the definition of small world network. I see we have some experts here who have studied various small world properties of the network like Natasha and, and Tatiana here. But um, we want to um, worry about um, when everything is nearby, then it's very hard to define an issue of a local neighborhood in a network. And this comes up even in things like classical function predictions. So I'm back, uh, like Trey, in the yeast world, where um, perhaps I have proteins of unknown function. Other proteins are labeled by an ontology, maybe Go, maybe MIPS, maybe um, Trey's ontology. And I am trying to maybe assign labels to proteins. Well, what a lot of people have said is, well, let's look in the local neighborhood of a protein, let's see what the labels are of proteins that are close by. Maybe that will allow us to infer something about the label of my protein. And, and the problem with that is that everything is close by. So if we look at a histogram of shortest path distances in yeast, this is, um, again, Baker's yeast, um, and maybe the data is about a year old or so. But um, if you look at the shortest path distances, almost everything is distance two or three apart. Okay, so if I want to look at my neighbors, my neighbors' neighbors, very soon I get the whole network. And what's going to rescue me from um, getting confusion is that I claim that not all short paths are equally strong indications of similarity. And um, to explain that, I'm going to give an in, uh, um, analogy from social networks. So... Um, so I, I think there are a bunch of people whose pictures on this slide you might recognize. Um, so um, you guys know who this is. Donna Sloan, she's sitting, sitting right there. And uh, Mona Singh is not here yet, but she's also a co-organizer of this workshop. And you know, clearly I know both of these um, colleagues quite well. And um, however, Trey Eidecker, who gave the talk this morning, I'd actually never met in person until today. Uh, however, um, I'm betting quite strongly that he probably knew, also knows um, Mona Singh and Donna Slonim. So um, if we kind of um, are connected by a length to path in, in say, social network of, of our friends, then, um, with, then we probably have something in common. Right? We probably, a lot of short um, paths through fairly low degree nodes, um, probably we have something in common. But on the other hand, uh, how many people know who this is, by the way? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> who is that? That's Whoopi Goldberg, right? So, so she's, she's a famous comedian and movie star. So if I happen to be like Facebook friends or fans with Whoopi Goldberg, right? Um, and then I look at all the other millions of people in the world who are friends with Whoopi Goldberg. Um, probably we don't have as much in common. Are you saying I don't have a lot of friends? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you're saying. I'm saying that I don't have a lot. <laughs> I'm saying that she doesn't have a lot. No. Um, but what, I, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is that, is that, all right. So maybe instead of Whoopi Goldberg, I should have put up Beyonce or, or the president of the United States. So, so compared to them, we don't have a lot of friends, um, or at least a lot of um, people who would like to claim their friends. Right. So, so somehow that if you have a big, um, high degree, famous node in the network, and you look at last two paths through that, I claim that has less similarity. So, so this is a social network. Maybe I should get away from these dangerous <laughs> analogies here. Um, because actually, it, it does tend to be the same in biological networks. If you look at the things that are giant hubs in biological networks, um, they could be things like chaperones. Okay? They could be things that are deal with the general machinery of the cell. And if you look at the things that interact with them, the things that interact with them might be interacting with them, and they're not very functionally similar. Maybe this is something that, you, that degrades proteins in the cell. 
Uh, it's the vacuum cleaner. Um, a lot of things are going to interact with that. They're not going to have a lot of functionality things in common. So it would be nice to design some kind of way to talk about similarity in these biological networks that kind of takes this into account. Um, so if we want a more fine-grained measure of pairwise similarity, I claim we need a new distance metric. Um, where, recall, I mean this in the mathematical sense of a metric, which a metric is something that satisfies three properties, if you remember your linear algebra axioms. Um, you only get zero if and only if you're looking to yourself. It's symmetric, and it satisfies a triangle inequality. And once we have a distance metric, we could look at the pairwise distance of all the different pa uh, pairs of nodes in the network. And this is that histogram again. When I look at shortest paths, which is a distance metric in the least network, just about everything is distance two or three. OK. So um, I'm going to give you a definition of a new net metric, which I'm going to call diffusion date distance. And I have this picture up here, which is also somebody in the audience. This is Ben Hescott. He's also talking about different stuff on Wednesday. Um, and everything I'm going to talk about today, just about, except for some of the new work I might mention at the end, is all joint work with um, Ben Hescott. Um, so what do we do? We define um, this HE vector between A and B to be the expected number of times the k-step random walk starting at A reaches B. OK? So first thing I want you to note, I want you to notice two things about this. First thing I want you to notice is that this is kind of getting at something that has the properties we want. So if A and B are uh, me and Trey, OK, then you're very likely to get there in a short random walk because we're joined by many uh, paths through low degree nodes, so these paths are likely to hit. On the other hand, if it's me and, um, I don't know, somebody else who likes Whoopi Goldberg, um, then these paths are not, not as likely because if I go to the hub node, then I'm likely to diffuse away to another one of its zillions and legions of neighbors. So paths through high degree nodes are less likely to contribute to this value, even if they're the same length. So, so that's good. But we're still not a metric yet, right? And the reason we're not a metric, this is not even symmetric yet. For example, if I'm in the center of this flower, um, then for any particular petal, my probability of going there is fairly low. But if I'm at the petal, I'm always going to go to the center, right? So this, is eight, so this is not even a symmetric function yet. So this is what I'm going to do. And there's a lot of math on the slide, but actually it's very intuitive, so let me walk you through it. Um, so again, we're defining that um, HE vector between two nodes A and B. For a particular node A, I'm now going to set up a vector which is its HE value to all the other nodes in the network. So think of, I'm taking a global view of the whole graph. It's like I'm scattering breadcrumbs. I'm looking at, for every other node, how often I reach that node in expected value. Okay, and of course, I'm also getting consensus of like zero random walks, so I um, always reach myself. And then what I'm going to do is for any two nodes now, I'm going to define the diffusion state distance between U and V to simply be the L1 norm of the difference of those vectors. In other words, what I'm going to do is for every node where they look different, in this measurement, I'm going to get a little bit of contribution to their dissimilarity. And I'm going to add those up. Yes? I didn't read the comment about the zero one or more, because it seems like that this is a metric only for even case. No, no, no. no. So why? It's fine. Uh, in a bit. But I, I will, I, I do want to continue, I want to keep the zero contribution because it's important for proving that. Um, it's only zero when um, the node is itself, but it works. OK. Yes? In the previous slide, yes, is the, if you look at the immediate the distance between the immediate neighbors, like the end, the center of the panel, as opposed to on the left side, A and one of those, are they all the same? Like, is your distance to Whoopi Goldberg the same as your distance to Roma? Um. Not necessarily, no, because I could go backwards. This is not directed. No. Okay. So, all right. So, um, in the paper, 
we proved that DSD is a metric. And not only is it a metric, but it turns out it converges as k goes to infinity. So that might seem counterintuitive the first time I write down this definition, that the length of the random walk um, doesn't matter. But let me convince you. So if you think about this graph, you can think about its mixing time. There is some point of time, let's say that everybody is in disparate points of this graph. When we're all exploring a city, at some point we wander around and we all reach the city center and we, you can't tell where we came from anymore. At that point, our rest of our random walk is making equal contributions to these values. So once the walk mixes, the rest of the duration of the walk doesn't contribute to this difference. And that's why it converges. Right? So at some point, the rest of the, so all the action is in the early steps of the random walk. Okay, so it turns out that um, you can convert. You so clearly, if you're doing up to particular k steps, it's easy to compute. You can also compute the converged DSD matrix, um, and it's just an eigenvalue computation. Um, so the complexity is um, dominated by the cost of inverting, finding the inverse of a matrix. So if we don't do anything terribly smart, that's going to be order n cubed. And in fact, we have code that implements this. OK, and um, for those of you who like matrix stuff, there is a deep connection, it seems, to the graph Laplacian and what we are doing. Um, this was proved by Bonelin and Al. Um, however, they took a different version where it's a walk with restarts, and they generalized to the um, LP norm. Yes? So how does this connect like, uh, to the so-called eigenvalue, eigenvalue centrality? Is that the same concept? So this is not a centrality concept. It's a dissimilarity concept. But these things are all related. OK, so all this diffusion stuff is extremely related. Um, and this seems particularly related to something which is called the Green's function that was um, first defined by Fan Chung. Yes? Maybe too early, but uh, what is the advantage of this metric over resistor distance? Oh, I've never studied resistor distance, so I don't know. Resistor distance may be great, but I will tell you why this metric is good. I, I, I cannot compare it to resistor distance. Okay. Um, okay. And actually, recently, Andrew Beveridge, um, who's a mathematician, proved that this means that DSD can be shown to measure the difference between random walks starting from U and V to a randomly chosen target node D. And, and, and maybe to answer your question, many other diffusion kernels and various things have been proposed for PPI networks. Um, and I put some of the references up here about sort of other measures that people have studied that are diffusion-based. Now, most of them are actually not a true distance metric, right? So we actually get the triangle inequality. Um, maybe I'll convince you later you should care. OK. So, all right, so, uh, so I claim DSD is worthy of study. It's mathematically natural. It's connected to the graph Laplacian. It's conversion independent of the la length of the random walks. And we have specifically designed it to downweight pass through hubs. OK, so, so but we're not going to care unless we can do something good in the applications domain. Um, and this should, should um, intrigue you, which is that when I actually write down that histogram for DSD distance on the same network, I get this beautifully, almost normal, smooth set of distances. And the reason that's really beautiful is that allows me to talk about things like the closest neighbor, the second closest neighbor, the third closest neighbor, right, before I had all these ties. And now I have this continuous measure of similarity that, again, I'm going to show works if you believe this business that things through hubs will contribute less to your similarity. Okay, so again, like Trey, let's go to yeast and sort of the very basic most studied problems where there's the most data. Let's look at classical function label prediction. Um, and so previously, the, the simplest classical method there is is you could ask, you could assign to a node that is unknown 
the, have all its neighbors vote with their label or multiple times with multiple labels and assign the label that uh, gets the highest number of votes. So we could do this with DSD instead where we have the K, K closest DSD neighbors vote. And in fact, we're not going to just do this for this. We're, we're going to do this for four different classical function prediction methods. We have sort of the normal method that I claim, even if they don't describe it this way, at some level is based on the shortest path distance underlying it for determining similarity in the network. We're going to look at majority vote. Neighborhood is a generalized majority vote to distance more than one. Multi-way cut method, functional flow method. And then we're going to look at a DSD version of these problems where we somehow incorporate the DSD distance instead. All right. So let's, and, and, and here are some more references for other people who have made important contributions to classical function prediction methods. I'm not going to talk about clustering methods. There's a wonderful survey of Sharon of all the work that was done to date by 2007. I'm sure there's been double the number of papers since because this is just a problem everyone works on. Okay. So, and what is the network that I'm going to show you res experimental results on? I'm going to do cross-validation on the yeast PPI network. Um, and this is a biogrid version of the network for now. Um, it has about 5,000 nodes, about 75,000 edges. And we're going to do 10 runs of two-fold cross-validation where we erase half the labels and pretend they're unknown and uh, do prediction. And we're going to report steam mean and standard deviation. The thing I want you to pay attention to is accuracy, where um, we're just going to write us mark the percentage correct when we assign each node its highest ranked label. We also compute something called an F1 score, which gets more into the sort of precision recall trade-off. OK, so people have talked about lots of um, ontologies, but no one has yet mentioned the MIPS FunCat. This is an ontology that is really only available for yeast. But the nice thing about it is it's a leveled hierarchy. It only has three levels. Um, and on the top level, there are 17 categories that are things like cell cycle or DNA. The second level, there are 74 categories, things like DNA processing. And then maybe you're on the third level at 10.0105. There's DNA repair and incrimination. There are 154 categories on the third level. We also have results on Go that I will describe. The problem with Go is, of course, it's a variable length hierarchy with lots of different lengths passed. And there's a question of how you give partial credit if you match an ancestor of another term. And you know there are ways people deal with that. We'll discuss that as well. OK, and, and so here's a little piece of the yeast interaction network and sort of gets at the power of doing this. Um, if I want to know the nodes in closest DSD distance to GLR1, it turns out the closest one is this MXR2. And it turns out to have the right functional label. The interesting thing about this is it's not even a direct neighbor. Um, but it's the closest in DSD distance because it has the most common neighbors. So DSD is somehow getting at that notion. OK, so majority vote is, I just told you, I'm going to have all my neighbors vote on my label. That's the classical method. DSD majority vote, I'm going to have the K closest neighbors, where K is a parameter. And here are the results. Um, if you noticed, um, original majority vote is doing about 50% on the top level of the MIPS hierarchy. And Oh, and DSD weighted versus DSD unweighted. These, these 10 or 12 closest neighbors have different DSD distance. We could have them vote equally, or we can have them vote in inverse proportion to their DSD distance. It turns out it doesn't make a lot of difference. Having them vote weighted improves things very slightly. So um, when we do that, you see the, the probability shoots up above 60% the minute we um, include about I don't know, eight or nine, 10 neighbors. Once we have at least 10 neighbors, it kind of stabilizes out. And it's pretty robust. So let's say we're going to set k equal 10 for the remainder of this talk. We'll just look at 10 neighbors and have them DSD vote. And then we get similar improvements on the second and third level. Um, I'm running short on time, and I have a lot more slides. So I am going to skip descriptions of some of these other functional flow, monosings, multi-way cut. Um, but we have DSD versions of all of these. You can see them in the paper. 
And um, in summary, in every single case, changing the metric to DSD improves things and improves them remarkably, actually. I was shocked sort of how much we're dredging out of the hairball. And the best one ends up actually being majority vote with weighted DSD. Okay. Oh, and we have Go results as well. And if we're going to do Go results, um, we want to worry about this giving partial credit for partially matching the Go term at a higher level of the hierarchy. But the percent improvement for all these methods of counting is about the same. Again, DSD is always helping you. Um, and we also did SPOMBE uh, just to do a sparser network. And proportionally, of course, if you have a sparser network, you're not going to do as well. But DSD helps you even more on sparse networks than it does on well annotated networks. So, which is good because we want to apply this in sparser context. Okay, so I'm going to skip all this. Yeah, you um, have more time than you think that clock is a couple minutes fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm racing away here. All right. Thank you so much. So, how much more time do I have? Do I have like 10 minutes? Five. Five to seven. Yeah. Five to seven. Okay. So, so far, a diffusion metric was defined for function prediction on biological networks. Um, and, and, and what I would, uh, one of the things I want to say is that a lot of people are like, there's all this diffusion stuff out there, why DSD? And I would say two things. I would say this whole class of methods is powerful, but part of the power comes in somehow designing your thing to measure the thing that lines up with whatever biological property you care about. In this case, I think the insight that we want to downway pass through hubs was really important. And therefore, we came up with a diffusion process that did that. If there's something else you're trying to model in your network, you want to change your diffusion process and model that. So a good question is sort of what are the properties that really mean similarity in these biological networks? And then, and then we can try to model them. And this first paper um, was published in PLOS 1. Um, there's code. You can come up with something that computes your DSD matrix. Um, everything's publicly available, and the paper's freely available. Okay. So, but eventually, we don't only want to do function prediction. We want to do the other thing people tend to do when they walk around these kinds of networks, which is disease gene prioritization. Um, and given a set of seed genes known to be implicated in some complex disease, we want to rank a set of other genes as most related to the seeing gene set based on the PPI network. This is also a very well-studied problem, and diffusion-based methods are known, again, to perform best. Um, but so in order to study DSD for disease gene prioritization, um, so DSD gives a gene-gene distance, several natural relays. So you immediately get a disease prioritization method if you generalize DSC to a gene gene set distance. So you have a set of disease genes. You want your distance to them. That defines some kind of order for disease gene prioritization. But before I do that, I have to deal somewhat with the human network. When I deal with the human network, I'm going to be dealing with other kinds of data because it's too sparse. I'm going to be dealing with co-expression data, very other kinds of data, a lot of which are noisy. So the first thing I want to do is something that Tamer talked about, which is I want to put confidence into my network. So, all right. So, so now I should say that um, these are slides that were made by uh, Meng Fei Kao, who's the first author on both these papers, my graduate student. And um, he does like calligraphy as a hobby. And he's like much better at making pretty slides than I am. So, so the quality of the graphics of the slides is going to go way up here. All right. So we have some data quality issues that um, you could have false positives and false negatives, as we discussed. Um, and in BioGrid, they don't give you a confidence, so we had to assign one. We did the simplest thing that uh, Gitter et al. suggested, which is that we just classified evidence as high throughput and low throughput, and then we um, came up with a score based on how many publications supported the interaction. So this is not based on the data. This is just based on the number of publications in BioGrid. And that gives you some kind of thing. So AC maybe is supported by one publication with high throughput techniques. AB is supported with one publication with high throughput techniques. BC maybe with one publication with high throughput techniques. CD with one publication with low throughput techniques and so forth. BE with two publications with high throughput techniques. 
gives me some kind of weights on the edges. And all I do is I rescale these probabilities so that they add to one and become probabilities out of a node. And now I just walk my network using those probabilities. Couldn't be easier. Call it CDSD. Not, nothing different in the algorithm, nothing different in the computation of the matrix, just using um, weights on the edges. And the other thing that I'm very interested in is incorporating known biological knowledge into my network as well. So biologists know a lot about pathways, sets of nodes that somehow work in concert. And the other thing I'm interested in, which is, is we're still work in progress, is how to talk about important nodes in the network. Um, so how could we incorporate pathway edges? One thing we could do is just say, well, these are well-curated edges. Let's just bump their probabilities way up and put them in naively as high probability edges and do what we did before. But that's missing crucial relationships between the paths, right? We actually know that in this graph, um, A and C to D is special, whereas A to C to E doesn't mean anything. And yet, if I just put the edges together, there's nothing that distinguishes ACE from ACD. So what am I going to do? Um, instead, let's do that. But at the same time, let's put the pathways also in as duplicate nodes as in their coherent holes. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two parameters that talk about when I walk on their basic network and when I walk instead on the pathways. And you can think of these pathways as kind of controlled access highways in the graph. Right? If I take the freeway, I could get somewhere quicker. So there are now multiple ways. Uh, there's my graduate student, Meng Fei. He's in a purple car. If he wants to get from A to C, he could go that way. He could go this way. Or he could take the highway. Okay, and those, all that does is just adjust the probabilities on the underlying network. And notice that this kind of adjustment is independent of DSD. I've changed just the uh, probabilities of the underlying network. So if you are interested in this resistance distance, or you're interested in some other measure or metric in the network, you can sort of play the same game and do that on your distance as well. Okay, and then I just aggregate the probabilities and come up with a giant probability for the pathways. I call that cap DSD. And again, I'm going to do cross-validation. I'm also going to do it on BioGrid with these probabilities, but I'm also going to look at the string network. And the string network comes with probabilistic um, values for each of the edges, and I'm just going to use them what string gives me. And let's just look at the majority vote, weighted majority vote methods because, again, that's what did best um, previously. Um, we have results on the other methods as well. And these were our previous results, just reminding you on MIPS, on the first level, second level, and third level. This was original uh, majority ver vote versus DSD majority vote. When I add confidence, and that's the light blue thing, all the probabilities go up again. Then when I tell it the pathway edges are particularly confident, confidence goes up a little bit more. And if I play this controlled access highway trick, things go up in confidence a little bit more, but not a lot. Um, so, and the highway trick, I should say, adds in this scenario, but in the more global methods like global multi-cut and functional flow, it actually degrades performance. So the highway trick doesn't work as well in those methods because they're so global. Um, and let me just summarize. Oh, and these are the string level results. And, and look at this. You go all the way up, weighted majority vote with um, these confident pathways is up to 71% accuracy on MIPS, which is really quite surprising if you know this to me. Um, and in string, it was even more important to use confidence on the edges, which should surprise nobody. Okay, so 
Time, okay. We have shown that new metrics help. <laughs> Incorporating confidence always and in pathways in which case helped even more. Our networks are naturally directed. Um, we don't know how adding directions might help us. That's an interesting question. We did some limited things with known directed edges, and there just weren't enough edges that where directors were known to matter. Um, but if we had a way to infer direction, we might be able to do something with that. Um, and um, the open question is how to find the right metric for other metric problems. And OK, I have to thank everybody. Um, OK, so here are the collaborators on the original paper. This is um, Ben Hescott. Um, this is actually Donna Slonim's PhD student at Jesus Jim Park. This is Mark Cravella at BU. This is Monk Fei Kao, his first author, Hao uh, Zhang, another author, Noah Daniels, who was my PhD student, is now postdocing at Bonnie Berger's lab. And this is just some more people, including some undergraduates who are on the second paper, and Donna Slonim and others. Thank you. Like a really simple question. When you calculate the DSD at the beginning, yeah. um, do you exclude the two nodes you're including? No. Yeah. No. You, you, you include all the nodes. All the nodes. Including themselves. Including themselves. Okay. Yes. So just a quick question. You never looked at hitting time or commute time. This is a hitting time formulation. So so not commute time. But you can rephrase a lot of what we're doing in terms of hitting time. I did not show that today. It's not exactly the same. Right now, we're looking at something that I can show you offline called the exit frequency distance. And it, is, it can be definitely formulated in terms of some hitting time. I, I ran out of time before I was able to talk about it. I'd like to see that. Yeah, happy. But it's nothing to do with a commute edition. Commute, commute time is a different way to symmetrize the random walk, and it doesn't look like this. So in terms of setting the label with the top K neighbors, what was your final choice of K? So we, result, we reported results in the paper for K equals 10. Um, however, the results from K, between K equals 10 and K equals 20 basically didn't change. That depends on the node. So you can imagine node, right? It, it, it must depend on the node. Yes. So I wonder if, if there's an improvement you could get by somehow adding an optimization to choose that K based on some network properties in that neighborhood. So have it scale by degree or something. Maybe something like that. Yeah, it could be. We didn't try it. That's a great idea. Yes. Yeah. question, uh, can you say anything about the convergence rate as a function of K? I, not as a function of K. Um, Oh, as a function of that K. I'm sorry, there are two Ks somehow. I, that was my mistake. Yes, yes, you can. You, um, we know a little bit about the convergence rate. One thing I do know is making it a lazy random walk where you allow, where you put in some restart pro probability is going to speed the convergence. Because um, this, there are two, there, there, there are two ways to look at this. In one way, um, Letting the random walk restart is more natural, and the other way, this is more natural. But if you let the random walk restart, I think convergence speeds up. Actually, it will converge faster. Thanks. I think we'll take the rest of the questions over lunch. So thank, thank you. you guys, and we'll be back in two.